hi everyone and welcome to Stellaris! So, it's finally here. I've been super excited about this game for a pretty long time now, and we can finally play it. So, if you don't know what Stellaris is, it's the newest space strategy game from Paradox Development Studio. And it's actually a bit of a hybrid between a classic 4X game and a grand strategy. So, it's not like their other strategy games so far. Europa Universalis 4, Crusader Kings 2, Victoria and so on. This is an actual 4X game. Or, as I said, it's a bit of a hybrid between 4X and Grand Strategy. And since I know people will ask me about this, if you want to know my actual opinion about the game, I will have a video specifically about that in a few days. So, keep an eye on that. Let's get into the game then. I got around 30-35 hours in the game, so I know what's up. I'm going to show you how everything works. This is a very deep and complex game. This game is just as deep as other strategy games from Paradox, but it's the easiest game to get into that they made so far. And it's partially because it's an actual 4X game. So you start from zero and build up your empire from there. So I already created the empire that we're going to play, but I'm going to show you how empire creation actually works. All these empires down here are ones that are pre-made. But it's best to create your own one. There's quite a lot of customization to it. So let's just hit edit and I'm going to show you how everything works. So we start from appearance and we can pick quite a few different options here. We have mammalian, we have reptilian, avian, and yeah, we have all kinds of options here and there are a lot of different portraits. I'm sure everyone can find something they like, and I'm sure there will be more in the future. So we're going to play as humans, because why not? And we're going to be the Terran Alliance. You can actually generate this, sort of randomly. It's partially based on your actual race and how you called it. There are also name lists, so if you are terrible at coming up with interesting names, you can pick one of these and then generate names from these lists. I picked Human Toe, as you can see. This will also affect things like ship names, leader names, planet names, fleet names, and so on. Then we also got the ruler. Now, keep in mind that your ruler will die eventually. He's not immortal, <laughs> so he will die. You're not going to keep one ruler for the entire game, just to be clear. And this is purely cosmetic right here. None of this actually affects gameplay, as in the ruler tab. And then we got trades. So you start with two points, and you can pick negative trades if you want to get more. In this case, we got three points worth of positive trades, which means I had to pick one negative to get an additional point. And you can pick up to four trades. There are some trades that cost four or even five points. So yeah, there's one that costs five points. So, what did I pick? We are going to be adaptive, which gives us plus 10% habitability. What this generally does is that it makes less friendly planet types easier to colonize for you. I'll get into the details once we start actually playing the game. But, in short, habitability makes less friendly planets for you easier to colonize and grow. We are also quick learners. We get plus 25% leader experience. This basically means that leaders within the game, so people like scientists, admirals, and so on, will get more experience faster, and they will get additional traits, because you get additional traits on leaders as they level up. And since I had to pick a negative trait, I picked weak, which is minus 20% army damage, but this only affects ground combat, so it's not really a big deal. It does not affect your ship damage. So, these are our trades. Next up, we got our home world. We can pick the solar system, so that's exactly what I did. Our home world name is going to be Earth, obviously, and Sol is the star name. And we prefer continental world. There are seven different options. There are continental, ocean, arctic, tundra, arid, desert, and tropical. And this basically affects which words will be easier to colonize for you. 
we got plus 80% continental habitability, plus 60% tropical, plus 60% ocean, and plus 20% desert and arctic. Now, we'll still have to research technologies to actually be able to colonize these planet types. The only one we'll be able to colonize right at the start of the game is continental, because that's our preferred type. And these percentages basically indicate what the happiness cap will be. 60% habitability means happiness will be capped at 60%. So as you might imagine, it's not easy to efficiently colonize planets where you only got plus 20% habitability. Yeah, next up we got city appearance. So there are six different options here. This is again just cosmetic, it doesn't actually affect gameplay. And then the interesting choices, government and ethics. So I'll try to explain this the best I can. So first of all, you have to pick your ethics, which is something that will affect your gameplay a lot. This can change as you play. And we got three points that we can spend. And the fanatic traits, which are the orange ones, cost two points. The regular ones cost one point. You also can't pick the opposite ethics. So for example, if we want to be spiritualist, we can be materialist. Anything that's on the opposite end is mutually exclusive, so we can't pick both. And I decided we're going to be a fanatic materialist, which is basically plus 10% to research output, because physics, society and engineering are science types, research types. These are three types of research that you do within the game. So this is basically a bonus to research. To be more precise, it's a bonus to your output on the actual planet. So you build science labs and then they are worked by your population. If you work a science lab or anything that gives you science, so anything that gives you physics, society or engineering, with a pop that's materialist, then you get bonus to that output. And we are also going to be pacifist, which gives you plus one to maximum embassies. I actually find this to be pretty good, because normally you can only have three embassies, and there are going to be a lot of empires within the game. And embassies are pretty important if you want to build good relations. We will also get minus 25% rivalry influence gain. Influence is one of the sort of resources in the game, and you can rival people to get additional influence. So the way that works is that you declare an empire as your rival, and you get influence just by doing that. And we'll have minus 25% modifier to that. We'll also have minus 10% army damage. So, because we have minus 20% from the weak trait, that's a total of minus 30%. But that only affects ground combat. We'll also get plus 10 food, which is quite nice. It will make our planets grow faster. And minus 10% war happiness. Happiness is something that affects productivity of your population. That's it in a nutshell. And then we also have the government type. There are quite a few different government types, and a lot of them have different requirements. So one of the reasons why I went for materialist and pacifist is because I wanted to be an enlightened monarchy. That's one of the government types that has specific requirements. So we have to be either a pacifist or fanatic pacifist. We cannot be individualist or fanatic individualist. So that's one of the reasons why I went for pacifists. The other one is maximum embassies. This doesn't mean we won't have wars. We will. So enlightened monarchy. This also allows us to build a special park building. And we also get plus one to core sector planets. I'll explain that as we play. Because if I wanted to talk about everything, we wouldn't actually start playing the game for two hours. We'll get minus 25% edict cost. So edicts are basically kind of like policies that you can implement for influence. And as you remember, we'll have minus 25% influence gain from rivalry. But at the same time, edicts will cost us minus 25% influence. So that kind of works well together, sort of. We'll get plus 25% edict duration, which can be quite nice, because edicts on your planets are limited in time. And that's that. So that's the government, our empire name is Terran Alliance, that's our flag right here. I can show you all the flag options, like so. Yep, and that's that. 
All right. And we can also pick our starting weapons. So there are three different types of weapons. Projectile, energy and missile. I picked projectile. They are kind of short range weapons, but they can do pretty good damage and they can burn through shields quite easily. There are also missile weapons, which are kind of the opposite of projectile, but they can be countered by point defense systems. And there are energy weapons, which are kind of like the best compromise between these two. Energy weapons are pretty good, but I already played for quite a long time with energy weapons as my base, so this time I'll go for projectile. And then we got the FTL method. So this affects the game a lot. These three FTL methods alone make the gameplay quite differently depending on what you choose. Each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. I decided to go for wormhole travel because it's kind of like the most interesting type. Hyperspace travel is the fastest but is the most restrictive because you can only travel along the existing hyperlane network, which can kind of limit you sometimes. You can sometimes get blocked by an empire. So for example, if you can only leave your general area of the galaxy through one or two hyperspace routes, and these are both blocked by other empires, and they are not willing to give you access or get friendly, then you'll pretty much have to attack them. There's also warp travel, which allows you to go pretty much anywhere, but it's the slowest method. And there's the wormhole travel, which requires you to build wormhole stations that have specific range. And you can travel anywhere within the range of the wormhole station. These are things you actually have to build with constructor ships. And finally we got ship appearance. This is purely cosmetic. So it doesn't matter what we pick here. And does that. So that's our empire. One interesting thing to note is that you can create many different empires and then you can force them to spawn within the game. So I was experimenting with some other options and I created some guys that have plus 120 years leader lifespan, which means they can get pretty damn experienced leaders with quite a few traits. They are also fanatic collectivist, which gives them minus 10% food consumption and materialist and they are despotic hegemony. Which means each ruler can build an elite assault army, that's a ground army. So I can force them to spawn in the game. You can just create a lot of different empires and play purely with handmade empires, because normally the game is filled by randomly generated ones. So let's get started, I'm looking forward to this. There are five galaxy sizes ranging from 150 stars to 1000. Now, I know a lot of people like to play on huge galaxies, but this can lead to some performance problems. 1000 stars is a lot, and it will really start to show later in the game. We'll play on medium. I was almost tempted to play on small, because really, 400 stars is still a lot. But we can go with medium, why not? And to make it a bit more interesting, we can pick Spiral with four arms. You can also set how many advanced AI stars there will be. So this basically spawns empires, AI empires, with an initial advantage in resources, technology and population. You can set this to zero if you don't want any AIs to have an initial advantage. It doesn't actually give them any bonuses over time, it just gives them a slightly stronger starting position. But I'm okay with a few advanced AIs. So there are also a few difficult levels. Normal means AI doesn't get any bonuses. Higher difficulties gives them bonuses. That's pretty much what it is. And they are less likely to ally human players. We'll play on normal. For now. And we can also disallow or only allow one specific FTL travel method. I won't be using that. That seems a bit silly. But you can only allow hyperspace travel, for example, and that will create a pretty different game, because any empire in the game will only be able to use the existing hyperlane network. And that makes the gameplay quite differently. <laughs> it really does. Alright, let's get started. So I will explain how the game works as we go. It's not too hard to get into the game, that's the biggest strength of the game. 
This game is just as deep and complex as other Paradox strategies, but it's way easier to get into it. So if you ever thought about getting into these kinds of games, Stellaris is easily the best one to start with. So there are a lot of things going on here. First, let's start from the map. So the way this works is that there are two different map modes. You're looking at one of them right now. This only shows one specific system and the planets within that system. If you want to view the entire galaxy, you have to either click down here or use the keyboard shortcut, like so, and then we can view the entire galaxy. That's the galaxy. You can't just zoom in to the system level and then zoom out back into the galaxy. You can click on a specific system to get back in there, or you can press the keyboard shortcut again to switch back and forth. It takes a little bit of time to adapt to, but after you play for a while, it's not really a big deal. It's just not how most games do it, it's a little bit different, but it works just fine. So, what's going on here? First of all, let's talk about the research, because we get prompts up here that we have to pick research, we can start with that. We got some leaders here, these are scientists. So, I'll show you the leader tab. You start with a few leaders. Uh, yeah, right here. So, these are our leaders, there are governors, Scientists, admirals, and generals. Governors are fairly self-explanatory, they give you bonuses on a certain planet. Or in a sector, but we'll talk about sectors later. Scientists are exactly that, scientists. Now, you can still research stuff without a scientist assigned, but it will be significantly slower. There are admirals, they lead fleets, and there are generals, they lead ground forces. And recruiting a leader costs influence. These are the resources up here. We got energy, which is mostly used for maintenance. It is required for some other things sometimes, but in the long run, energy is basically mostly maintenance. There are minerals. They are used to buy a lot of things and pay for a lot of things, as you might have guessed. And there's influence, which is used for edicts, recruiting leaders, and these kinds of things kind of like a political influence. And then we got three different research types. So this is our physics research output, society research output, and engineering research output. Right now we're getting it because these are base yields that we get from our home planet. And these are strategic resources, we got none at the moment. And this is our directly controlled planet limit. We can control up to six planets. We get plus one because we're an enlightened monarchy. And if you colonize more than this, you'll have to assign some planets to sectors. We'll talk about that once we get there. But basically the way it works is that most of your planets in the long run will be assigned to sectors, which you can manually assign. And these sectors are managed automatically. And you have to decide which planets or which systems are of strategic importance for you and you want to have direct control. And you only get to control these planets manually. And we have naval capacity. So we have up to 12 units worth of naval capacity right now. We start with a very weak fleet and they take 3 out of 12 military capacity at the moment. So next up we got the actual planet. So let's talk about planet a bit. You get to actually manage the surface of the planet each planet is divided into tiles. We got 16 right here, but they can have anywhere from like 9, 10 to 25. And you have exactly the amount of tiles that the planet will tell you. Not sure if there's any habitable world. We don't know yet because we need to survey. But there's a number over here. Planet size 16, and that means it will have 16 tiles. Planet size can vary from like 8, 9 to 25 or so. And then we got a specific bonus associated with each tile. And this basically means that if you construct a building that generates this kind of resource on this tile, then you will get that bonus. So for example, we have one mineral here and we can build a mining network which produces two minerals. And as a result, it will produce three. You can build anything on this tile, but if we try to build a farm, we'll get a warning that this will basically remove the one mineral that we would otherwise get from it. So it's obviously more optimal 
to use these bonuses. It's not always possible, but it's a good idea to use them for sure. So, since minerals are very damn important at the start, we will get started on a mining network right away. You can assign citizens to various tiles, so you can switch all of this around. And if we click on our citizen, we'll get exact stats. So, there's one important stat in here. Two important stats. There's happiness. Happiness is limited by habitability. So, if you remember, we don't have a habitability bonus. Your home planet is always 100. But a lot of planets will be 60, 80, even 30. And habitability is basically maximum happiness. So, if you have 70% habitability, the maximum happiness of your population will be that number. So, 70% if it's 70%. And happiness affects productivity of your population. And if they are less happy, they will be more likely to join rebellious factions. So, you want to maximize happiness where possible. Or at least you don't want it to drop too low. And then we have the second important stat, which is Ethics Divergence. Ethics Divergence is basically a chance for that specific population to change ethics. So, what might happen is that you might, for example, lose the fanatic materialist or lose pacifist. It's not always strictly a bad thing, but it can cause unpredictable effects, let's just say. It can be a good thing sometimes. Sometimes you might get ethics that are better for you. But yeah, the lower this number is, so negative is actually a good thing, the more likely it is that this pop will conform to your empire's ethics. But as I said, it's not strictly a bad thing if it's in the positive. And other than that, if you hover over the pop, you'll get information about that pop. So right now everyone has the same ethics, obviously, because we just started the game. And I think that's it. So we also start with a construction ship and science ship. The science ship is what you use to survey planets. So as you might have noticed, all of these planets are marked as not surveyed, so we don't know what's going on here, we don't even know what the habitability is. And that's what we use our science ship for. We can tell the science ship to survey the entire system. So if I right click on any of these, we can survey the exact planet if we want to, because we can see what kind of planet this is. And since we know we prefer continental worlds, I can try to find a continental one and survey that one first, if I really want to speed things up. It's usually just best to survey the entire planet, survey the entire system. So we'll do exactly that. Survey the system, and we have the construction ship. We can't actually do anything with it just yet. We can use it to build wormhole stations, because the way our FTL travel method works is that we have to build wormhole stations, and we got one right here. That's a wormhole station. And they all have a range. You can see the range of our wormhole station right here. We can move directly to any of the systems within the range of the wormhole station. If we want to travel further, we have to build wormhole stations. You don't have to build wormhole stations within your territory. So I could go to, let's say, this system over here, build a wormhole station here, and then my range will be extended by that wormhole station. So that's basically how it works. Travel time is instant, but it does take some time to actually start your engine. So to actually initiate wormhole travel. You don't jump instantly, but you do appear instantly at your actual destination. And research. So, the way research works is that, as I already mentioned, it's divided into three different categories, and you have separate output for all three. And when you select your research, you get a list of a few texts to choose from. This is semi-random. It's semi-randomly picked from the list of available technologies. And it's basically decided by your current progress, sometimes by some other factors. So, a lot of planets, most planets, will have so-called blockers, which we have to clear. We can already remove any of the blockers on our home planet, but what normally happens is that each planet has different types of blockers, and you have to research how to remove that specific type. So if I colonize a planet that has, I don't know, let's say active volcanoes, 
we'll get a tech here that will give us a chance to research how to remove active volcanoes. There's a bit more to that. There are also rare technologies, there are dangerous technologies, but we'll talk about that as we play. So, the first tech we should start with in society is always New World Protocol, because that will allow us to build a colony ship. If you skip this technology, it will pop up again, but it might not pop up for a while, so it's not a good idea to start with anything other than this, because you might not get a chance to recruit colony ships for a while then, if you don't start with New World Protocol. And then we got Physics. So we can research gravity sensors, which will give us plus 15% survey speed. And we can also, this will unlock an actual component. I'll talk about ship design a little bit later. I don't want to do everything all at the same time. We can get plus 5% research speed. And we can unlock a module. This is a module for a space station, because each planet can have a spaceport. And that's basically a module for the actual spaceport. This is where you build ships, as you might have guessed. So that's what it is. And it will give us more energy. It's not bad, it is quite useful, but let's grab that research speed. The sooner we get that, the bigger the benefit will be in the long run. As for engineering, we can unlock engineering facility, which is a building that you can upgrade a science lab to, because we can build a basic science lab right here, and the science lab can upgrade to a specialized lab that will be focused on physics, on society, or on engineering. And the engineering station is exactly that. Other than that, we can unlock nanocomposite armor, which is armor for our ships, and we can unlock improved spaceport, which unlocks spaceport level 2. Bigger spaceports basically unlock more modules, and the bigger ships. Right now we can only build the smallest possible ship type, the Corvette, but we will need a higher level spaceport to build bigger ships once we get access to them. And upgrading the spaceport will unlock all these other modules. We can't actually get anything for these module slots, so there's no point rushing improved spaceport that much. We'll grab engineering facility. Yep. And now we can actually unpause the game. So there are five different speeds. There's the slowest, the default is normal. There's slowest, slow, normal and fast. And fastest. Because as you might have figured out already, this is not a turn-based game. This is a real-time pausable game, just like Europa Universalis 4, Crusader Kings 2 or any other Paradox game, basically. So we'll use fastest and wait for our scientists to survey these planets. We got a new air because the way our government works is that there are no elections. There are a lot of government types with elections, but we don't get elections because we're an enlightened monarchy. We'll get a new ruler once our current ruler dies. Our current ruler has two traits. Home in the sky, which is minus 20% spaceport build cost, and minus 20% spaceport module cost, and minus 15% building cost. So this is for buildings on the actual planet. And our air has Space Miner, minus 25% Constructor build cost, and minus 25% Mining Station build cost, and plus 1.0 monthly influence. This is actually really nice, because influence is a pretty important resource, actually. There are a lot of things that you can do with influence. And one of these things are edicts. There are two different types of edicts. We have edicts on specific planets. So if I go to my home planet, there's an edict list right here. We will unlock more edicts as we play, because a lot of edicts require specific technologies. Right now, we can get an edict that would give us minus 10% ethics divergence, that would be kind of useless at the moment. We can get plus 100% migration attraction, that wouldn't be very useful either, because people have nowhere to migrate to or from. Once we make contact with other empires, we'll be able to sign migration access agreements, and then our population will be able to migrate to their planets, and their population will be able to migrate to our planets, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on a lot of factors. We can get minus 25% building cost and construction time. This is not bad. And we can get spirit of science, which is plus 20% output to all science types. 
This can be quite nice if you have planets with a lot of science output. Would be a bit of a waste of influence right now, especially since we actually have zero here. So this would literally have no effect whatsoever. And then there are empire-wide edicts. So if we go to our government, there's a policies tab. And these are the edicts that will affect our entire empire. And these are not like the planet edicts, they do not have a duration. You can enable them or cancel them at any time, and they have a monthly cost. So all of these would cost 0.75 influence per month to maintain. And we can get minus 10% ethics divergence, and minus 5% research speed, we obviously don't want that right now. We can get plus 10% research speed and minus 15% ethics divergence, and I might pick that up because that will give us some techs faster. And there are quite a few important techs to get early on, especially in society research. Not just the colony ships, but also techs that will make planets easier to colonize. If you get unlucky, there will be a lot of planets near you that you just can't colonize early on until you get some techs. So we can actually enable this. Plus 15% ethics divergence is not really a big deal at the moment. We'll enable that. I wouldn't want to lose the plus 10% modifier to our science, and it's possible that we lose it if we get a lot of ethics divergence. So in that case, that would be a bad thing. But I like the early research bonus. This is a bonus that's applied directly to these numbers over here. So as you can see, we get plus 10% because we are encouraging free thought. Each of these scientists also has a trade. So she has plus 25% years lifespan, this guy has plus 15% leader experience gain, and she has plus 10% research speed in materials, because each tech has a specific category. I don't think we had anything... Yes, we did actually have one in materials. So we would get a 10% bonus to this number over here if we research nanocomposite materials right now with her. We can also reassign them. So if we get, let's say, a tech that has materials category in one of these other categories, we could reassign her to that slot, and it's generally worth doing that. And I think we can unpause by now. Yep, let's unpause. And survey a few planets. But yeah, back to edicts, because I didn't show you all of them. Then we got edicts that will increase research speed of a specific category. So in fact, I think that's going to be better, because I'd like to speed up society. Yeah, so let's go for that. We're still in the first month, so the maintenance was not applied yet. We'll go for society research grants, which gives us plus 30% research speed to society. And as a result, we get plus 32%. That will unlock the colony ship faster. And then we'll want to get some techs that will allow us to colonize different planet types. So let's wait for our scientists to survey a few planets. And I'll show you what exactly you can do with planets, once we actually survey something useful, which so far we haven't. And I'll show you what the constructor is actually used for, other than building wormhole stations. Come on, bro. Find something useful, thanks. What am I paying you for? We could jump to nearby systems with our actual military fleet, but there's no real need to do that. We can do that to see what's going on. Sometimes there are hostile ships in some systems, but we can't actually survey with our military, as you might have guessed. That's not what they do. If there are any hostiles, it's unlikely we'll be able to beat them with this fleet, because it's not exactly impressive. All right, we found some useful things. So there's one option down here, which is details map mode. You can either click this and enable it permanently, or you can hold alt and show them temporarily. I think I'll just enable that permanently for now. Yep. So these are the resources we can get. We can get plus two energy from the actual star, and we can get plus two minerals from the asteroids over here. And the way we do that is with the constructor. We just build a mining station. We can either right-click on the asteroid, or we can pick a mining station from the list over here, and then it will highlight all the valid targets for that. And there's the third method. We can select our construction ship, go to the galaxy map mode, 
right click on the system and then pick build mining stations. It will build all of them. There's no option to build just one single one if there are several valid targets. This will make it build all the mining stations that it can possibly build in this system. Right now we want to focus on minerals because the colony ship will cost 350 minerals. And we found an unidentified object. Alright. That's probably one of our neighbors. Well, its military strength is twice as high as ours, so I can't really do anything about that. Encounter. Yes, this has to be one of our neighbors. So now, once you make contact with someone, you don't automatically open diplomatic channels or whatever. These are unknown aliens to you. And you actually have to research them, so to speak. So if I go to situation log over here, or plus F5, we'll get all the special things that we can do. So right now we can investigate Alpha Aliens, which will finish in 180 days, and it will use society research. So this would put the colony ship on hold. We don't really need the colony ship right now, and it's the first tech we'll get. So we can research this. It will be done in six months. And once we finish this research, we'll make contact with them. Now, this is not always other empire. You can get different things from this. It's not just about making contact with other empires. And yep, that's that. All right, let's carry on. We found one more planet with two energy. Nice, that's the gas giant. Useful. And we're still building that mine on the asteroids. Alright, I'm going to slow down too fast for a moment. And pause when something is going on. Yep, beta aliens. So that's going to unlock the second option in the situation log. And our leader gained a level already. That's the actual scientist on the science ship. Sometimes these leaders can get traits that are useful for the actual science ship. Because this is the same category of the leader as the actual scientist. This is the scientist category. So you can also use these people to research text. And right now she has a bonus to anomaly research speed and anomaly fail risk. I'll show you what anomalies are once we actually find one, because we've not found one so far. Hopefully we'll get one. All right, maximum speed for a bit. The start of the game is not super fast, but that's actually a good thing. The game gives you time to learn how everything works. It doesn't throw everything at you all at the same time. Right, we obviously can't beat these guys. So this is not an actual empire. These are some aliens that we don't know anything about right now. This is not an actual empire, just hostile aliens in that system. Okay, back we go. So we can't actually go there just yet. They were a little bit too strong. Alright, we can jump to other systems. We won't have to bother going there with our scientists initially. And we finish the mining station, so now we get plus two minerals from that. And we can get the energy now. Alright, but I think this is a good moment to make a cut. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this first episode. If you did, please consider leaving a like or a dislike if you didn't. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.